Verse 4. Yeah. We're moving now. Should be a few weeks and this will be over with, this whole chapter. <laughs> and he went in unto Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. Now, we would already discussed a lot of this. But uh, my little topic under it is why a boy? Okay, Ishmael is going to be a boy. Why a boy? Or, if said by Sarah, why a boy? Because <laughs> that just confuses everything. If it had been a girl, nobody would have thought Ishmael was going to be the, the promised seed. Right? But no, the Lord... The Lord does it and makes sure that it's a boy. Okay. So, never mind. <clears throat> All right. So I'll read. Of course, the child has not yet manifest, which, by the way, won't be brought forth until the end of this chapter. But she has, she conceived, and she is, as we say in the old country, stagnant, <clears throat> pregnant. And um, uh, But we know that the child will be a boy. And um, Hagar will have a son, but could have had a girl. By it being a son, it only confuses the situation even unto this day. All right. So she could say, we could say, well, it's unfair that God would let it be a boy. It's unfair. He's just making things harder. Why is it this way? Da, 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 da. Okay, we have all this stuff, see. We've got it all figured out why it should be our way. But we're not God, and we don't know things the way that he sees it. And, you know, it, it always throws me that we're shocked that God does something different than what we think. I mean, it shocks me that we're shocked that he does that because everybody knows the scriptures. Uh, his ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. So when he does something different, we should go, see? His ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts. But instead we go, why would he do that? What's up with that? That doesn't seem right. I mean, not that I'm God, but it. But, yeah, just let me be God for a moment. No. <clears throat> no, thank God. We won't allow that. It says that we can have the son, but he be nothing like what God originally intended. Because that's what Hagar is going to bring forth. This son comes by being joined to religion and produce a kind of son but not the one of the father's heart. So there is the key right there. It's always the son of the father's heart. That's always going to be the issue, folks. And we we'll, we can go, well, I tithe and I go to church and I'm a Christian. Why would he do it this way? He's not, you know, he's not doing all things after the pattern of you. He's doing it after the pattern of Christ. And the sooner we learn that, the more we will say, okay, you know, it's probably best that I begin to forget about trying to figure out God in relationship to me and start figuring him out in relationship to his son. Okay? So, you know, we're, we're looking for answers for my life. Well, he's got an answer for our life. That's his son. He's got it. <laughs> we've got it but we don't know not really when I say we don't know we may know it theologically we may know that that's what we teach here but when it comes right down to it we're going well why is God leading me in this direction and you know and and you know does anybody remember all that has happened with Abram up to this point. Does anybody? 
And he would lead him over here. He would say, unto thee I will give the land. And Abraham's going, yeah, okay. And then a famine comes on the land. He goes, we got to get out of here. And a bunch of stuff like that kept happening. And, you know, and if that's you, you would be going, now what's going on here? This doesn't seem fair that you would make that promise and immediately bring a famine. This doesn't seem fair that da 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 and then this happened. And, and remember, it seemed like every time that God would say something new, what would immediately happen after that would be seemingly in the opposite direction. <clears throat> and yet, and yet, when the story's over, when we reach uh, Genesis 22, we find the father and the son being the only two left standing. You see? And with them is an altar. And there's even more to that, but I don't want to give that away. I want to say more than that. No, there's nothing more than that. But there's a... Um, there's a proving factor that when it's all said and done, it's just going to be the Father and the Son and the altar, and we're either going to be in the Son, and all things will happen according to his life, or we will be trying to live a Christian life that was never meant to be in that form. Just a Jewish life, still having God up there, and still praying and trying to get God to do stuff. That's the way it was in the Old Covenant. The New Covenant. We're born again of incorruptible seed. You know who said that? Peter said that. Peter said, being born again of incorruptible seed. And he said that because he was the one that was stood there and was around the campfire, and they had taken Jesus, and we're going to crucify him. And I read one particular um, gospel. Three different people asked him, "Weren't you with him? Weren't you there?" No, I don't. I don't know the man. And the second time, no, I I don't know him at all. And the third time, it says that he. And it's not just the simple he cursed. It was. You know, and denied him. <clears throat> and Peter learned a lesson. I am corruptible seed. I can be corrupted by the enemy or my own flesh. I don't believe the devil messed with Peter at all. Do you? I believe, I believe it was simply seeking to save. Just, well, I want to save me, you know. Let him die, but save me. Does that sound bad to anybody? Be honest, does it? Isn't that the basis of Christianity? <laughs> Let him die and save me. <laughs> okay. But it's not really the basis of Christ. It's not the basis of his nature. But it's the basis of what people believe. And they say, let him die that I may live. But what we see in Peter is a realization that later on he realizes, you know what? I... I'm selfish. I, I think of myself. I'm, I constantly uh, am, you know, doing the things that I want, going the places that I like, doing this and that. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, except if, we're, if that's how we operate. And it's not, well, I, I, if I want to go see a movie, I go see a movie. But if I want to go see a movie and... You know, there's a need and maybe I could be there for someone or whatever. Then I choose the life of the Lord to do that. And I know we all do that to some degree anyway. I think most Christians will do that. But Paul said, I bear about in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. You know, it's like I bear the wounds of the cross. Anyway, I don't want to get into that too much. But um, 
So the last statement was this son comes by being joined to religion uh, and or produces a kind of son, but not the one of the father's heart. All right. So you could say, uh, now, now if we go by Galatians, it's an allegory, and the allegory is that Ishmael represents Israel that now is, Jerusalem that now is. Um, and... And Isaac represents the seed. Galatians 3.16. But there is a... There is an understanding that there's two nations that came out of that. And that we can be of one nation or we can be of the other nation. We say, well, I don't want to go there either. See, it's really difficult because there's, I, I have to make sure I don't jump ahead for you. But the story in Genesis at this point does not focus on Ishmael's birth. So in the interim, we will be faced with how this situation plays out between Sarah and pregnant Hagar. It all starts immediately after Hagar conceives and with her attitudes towards barren Sarah. Okay. So she, Sarah, comes to Abraham and says, uh, uh, I was despised in her eyes. And um, that word is used in Job chapter 40, verse 4. There it's translated con- contemptible. Uh, we will find that that word is going to be translated different in a lot of different places but it means um, looking down thinking that you're better Um, and as a matter of fact I'll just say it here it's the word that when we were in Ireland and we we were using Noah y'all remember that And, and the word violence God was saying, I'm going to destroy the world because, well, the word violence is actually this attitude of being superior and talking down to people and stuff like that. Um, And that, that verse, I'll just read it to you. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I lay... I will lay mine hand upon my mouth. And so it's the word vile there. I am vile. Okay. Now just think real quick about the book book of Job. What's the book of Job? How does it present Job until he sees God? And, you know, and then, then he realizes what he has been. And he realizes, you know, that everything that he was doing was wrong. And as it were, he comes to a revelation of Christ. I, I, I abhor myself and repent in sack, sackcloth and ashes, he said. Um, he was talking down. He was, you know, superior, at least in the attitude of... Well, y'all don't know, you know. So, so she comes to Sarah comes to Abraham, and and it says, and Sarah said unto Abram, this is verse five, my wrong be upon thee. Well, that'd be nice if we could just do that. Anytime we mess up, just come up to somebody and go, my wrong be upon me. (laughs) I have given my maid into thy bosom, and when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and thee. So Sarah is complaining about Hagar's attitudes. Um, And we're going to get into this. But what we're going to see is that Sarah starts really treating her bad. Okay. 
And one thing to understand from the very beginning is that Sarah was part of Abraham when God called him. She's included as one with him. She's expected oneness from him, from through him. Hagar, even though she conceived and everything, it's a different situation. Hagar is an Egyptian. She was an Egyptian slave. Um, God's not looking at Hagar and going, I expect you to, to be everything that the firstborn is going to be. Do you see the difference? The firstborn being, which, by the way, that's why we're into this whole thing. The firstborn. This is about the firstborn. This is about him being formed in us. It's about the firstborn being formed in us. And the firstborn is slated for what? Death. He's, he's slated for death. He's slated for being sacrificed. And that's the story of Exodus. Um, so God saves the firstborn through death. He saves them from death by death. Amen? Amen. Exodus. He saves the firstborn because God said, I'm going to send the death angel basically through the land and he's going to kill all the firstborn. So I'm firstborn of all Egypt, but he says, you need to put blood on your doorpost so he can pass over and not kill your firstborn. Right? So when the death angel passed over, he was going to kill all the firstborn that hadn't killed the lamb eaten the lamb, put lamb in them, and proved the death outwardly. Firstborn. Firstborn. Everyone else in the house were not firstborn. I'm talking about Israel. <clears throat> they were not firstborn. They were not saved by the death of the lamb. Amen? Amen? They weren't saved by the death of the Lamb. They were saved from bondage. They were delivered from bondage. And that's what the Lord said. He said, he said of the firstborn, he says, he says to Moses, go down there and say unto Pharaoh, let my firstborn go. And then later he said, let my people go. And he said, and deliver them from the house of bondage. Y'all remember that? That was Israel. That wasn't the firstborn. The firstborn was going to go out into the wilderness under God. And as it were, let's just put it on our terms, live sacrificially. God wasn't expecting any of that from Hagar. You see? Just trying to make that clear. Because Hagar, you know, Hagar is the first one who did something between Sarah and Hagar. She's the one who acted uppity, as you will, you know. So Sarah could say, well, she started it. You ever said that before to somebody or about some? Well, he started it. He, he hit me first. Okay. See, if we can understand the way God sees things, then he doesn't, it doesn't matter to him who started it. It's the, it matters to him who is the firstborn or has the firstborn formed in them. Christ in his nature, in his self-giving nature, sacrificial. That's what he's concerned with. So we're going to see the hammer ending up falling on Sarah. Okay? And it's going to be bad. All right. Um, the main subject of these three verses has to do with Sarah negatively reacting to Hagar. Yes, Hagar's attitude was first. That seems to be justification enough to raise the stakes on attitudes for Sarah. In other words, well, she started it. So I can, I can you know, I mean, after all, I'm the wife of Abraham, and there's no slave Egyptian going to start giving me an attitude. Okay? 
So where does that come from? It comes from a mentality that I'm justified in doing this. She shouldn't have done that to me. Not just me, but me who is somebody. Hello? I know y'all have never done that. But if you ever do... (laughs) Um, so the trouble began with two things first Abraham went into her the second one she immediately conceived this changed the family dynamic for a family whose primary existence was about obtaining the firstborn in other words up to this point it was all about the firstborn now it's still about the firstborn but it's not really why not really Because this isn't the firstborn. Ishmael's not going to be the firstborn. Before we get through with it, we'll we'll explain all of your little questions that you probably don't have but would have if you really thought it through pertaining to, well, wait a minute. Ishmael was the firstborn. Isaac hasn't been born yet. What? (laughs) Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll get into all that. Um, the result was that Hagar felt higher than Sarah. All right. So, somebody feels higher than you. Somebody acts like it. Somebody talks. I wish I knew good English instead of uppity and somebody talks snotty to you. That's all I know. I'm from Texas. Sad, isn't it? But that's all I got. And you get upset. You think, well, that, you know, what's she giving me that attitude for? What's he giving me that attitude for? And all this stuff. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It shouldn't. In light of being the firstborn, lay down your life. In light of it being the lamb, and you lay down your life. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't disturb you so much. But it disturbs you because you're not acting like the firstborn. You're acting like an Egyptian. Okay? Still early in the story, there will be changes. Does that give you hope? <laughs> well, there will be. There will be. But it's, we're, we're learning, amen? We're in this journey. And we're finding out things and these things are being added to us. And the Lord, by his spirit, will bring to remembrance those things that you need when the time comes. But it would be good. I don't know how to do it or how to tell you to do it. But it would be good if you realized that as the firstborn, with Christ being that firstborn in you, You really don't have any place being upset in situations that are perfectly made by the Father to get His Son. I mean, that's all. See, we talked about about random lives or God. Well, God is a Father. And He arranges these things. And we go, well, the devil did this. Well... No, I mean, here's a good example. Read Romans uh, 7 and look at, well, the, th- the good that I would do, I don't. But the, you know, the bad that I don't want to do, I end up doing. It never mentions the devil there. Every ounce of that is us. Okay? So, you know, I mean, it's great to, you know, it's like, you know, Hagar, my my sin be on you well the devil made me do it isn't that the same thing the devil made me do it you know well no the devil suggested it he tempts we move we either respond to the temptation or we don't right being tempted is not a sin acting on it is So, um, so Sarah complains. 
Sarah then goes to Abraham, my wrong be upon thee. She admits being wrong. I'm wrong, but it's on you. (laughs) My bad, but it's on you. Right? You got that? Okay. Um, She admits being wrong, but she does not own the blame. She blames him for going into Hagar, though she suggested it. But the greater complaint is somehow, in her mind, the fact that Hagar despises her, which she claims is his fault. In other words, she's not, at this stage, she's not even griping about the son that's going to come forth. Sarah isn't. She's not griping about the fact that, you know, you were with Hagar. That was my suggestion. She's going, well, she shouldn't have been snotty to me. I mean, right? She may even want him to suffer for the wrong she has experienced at the hands of Hagar. My wrong be upon me. I would like for you to suffer because I'm suffering. How about that one? Anybody ever done that one? I'd like you to suffer because I'm suffering. There's the old uh, kicking the cat picture. The wife's at home cooking a good meal. She's fixing everything up for her husband. He's had a bad day at work. Somebody at the office has been messing with him and, you know, is over him and is, you know, making him do all this stuff and everything. And he comes home. As soon as he goes through the door, the cat walks by and he kicks the cat. (laughs) What'd the cat do? Right? What did the cat do? But we're upset. We probably figure, I don't want to kick my wife because I'd like to eat. (laughs) So, you know, well, we do that. I mean, again, the cat is a good example because it's innocent and it couldn't have done something in that sense. And so we just got to get it out. So there's either... I want you to suffer because of what you did to me because I'm suffering. How about that one? Is that, is that beautiful or what? It's so beautiful. That's, that's, that's like the beauty of Esther going in to be with the king. Huh. Or is that Vashti? Anyway, um, there's that. You know, you did this to me. I'm suffering I want you to suffer, and if you're Jewish, I want you to suffer ten times more. Some some of you might understand that. Maybe you don't. Don't mess with Israel. That's all I can say. (laughs) The nation of Israel. Um, Or, well, if I can't say anything to you or do anything to cause you, you to suffer for doing what you did to me, then I'll kick the cat. I'll jump on somebody else. I'll have an attitude towards somebody else. You know. All right. I don't have kick in the cat in my notes, by the way. <clears throat> so, uh, the Lord judged between me and thee. Holy moly. Did you hear that? This is a wife saying the Lord judged between you and me. She's supposed to be one. The Lord judged between, never mind, (laughs) because that means I'm separate if I'm saying that. But that's what she said. And Sarah's appealing to the Lord's judgment between him and her. Okay, well, that's not a good idea either unless you're just appealing to it because you really want the Lord. But if you're saying, well, let the Lord show who, you know. I mean, I've actually had to do that a couple of times, but it was to 
get a few people's attention. But I don't recommend it for you because I'm crazy. <laughs> and it's the truth. Um, so, notice that she gave Abraham her handmaid, and I have given my maid into thy hand. But Hagar's contempt concerning her being her slave was manifested when she had conceived. And then, of course, the attitude that came with it. I imagine that Sarah and Hagar had many womanly talks about God and the talks of having a firstborn son, etc. I can assume that in the conversations, Hagar was just a slave who had nothing herself but just to primarily listen to Sarah. Okay, well, if, if Sarah was used to that, oh, and keep, don't do a little more of my hair over here. Uh, oh, you know, and, you know, Abraham, uh, he just, he's, he's such a kind husband, and, you know, and, and we're on our way. This, this whole land's ours. And Hagar, since she's a slave girl, is probably going, oh, that's so wonderful, you know. That's just, you know. And, you know, oh, and, you know, a goat stepped on my foot yesterday. Hagar goes, oh, I'm so sorry, you know. You know. <laughs> and then, you know, now she's conceiving and having an attitude, and Sarah says, this is justification. I can do this because she doesn't understand anything about the firstborn. And we don't either when we do that. We clearly don't. We don't understand it, and that's okay. Uh, all of you who have done stuff like that up to this time, I have the Lord forgive you of all your sins. Go and sin no more ever again. <clears throat> And good luck with that one. In verse 5, a phrase says this, I was despised in her eyes. We previously explained this word. It is the word violence. The word violence has a different meaning than today. It involves the violent, here it is, Here's the, here is the one that you need to capture because for those of you who are in Noah, the Noah class particularly, but it is an important word and it is. Um, violence has a different meaning than today. It involves the violent disregard and open glorying and triumph over another. As such, it speaks of oppressing, oppressing, oppressing another person. That word was used in Genesis 6, 11. The earth also was corrupt before God and the earth filled with violence, with with violent disregard and open glorying and triumph over another uh, and oppressing another person filled with that and God looked upon the earth and behold it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth which is to be in his image the lamb the firstborn and God said unto Noah the end of all flesh has come before me for the earth is filled with violence through them Violent disregard, um, open glorying and triumph over another, oppressing another person. Verse 6, And Abram said unto Sarah, Behold, thy maid is in thine hand, do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarah dealt hardly, that word hardly, same word except oppressingly, Oppressingly, with her, she fled from her face. Okay? So now that verse 
shows you that Sarah is not just pleased to go to Abraham and complain or to feel insulted and do that. Now Abraham has said, well, she's your maid, do it what do what's in you. Do what's in you. And she deals oppressively with her so hard because the word hardly there is is showing you the depth of it, the increase of it, the power of it. So hard that she fled from her face. All right. That right there, folks, ticked God off, and he said, I'm going to destroy everybody. Wait till you see the avalanche it's going to cause here. You're not going to believe it. You're not going to believe it. This thing is going to be on a scale of the flood, except for it's not going to wipe everybody out, but it is going to wipe out millions and millions, ultimately. All right, so since at this point there's only one supposed heir, which is Ishmael, all centers around Hagar and the apparent baby of promise. I got it in parentheses. The baby of promise. Uh, Sarah is jealous that Hagar could do that and could do what she could not do and gets an attitude toward her by turning the tables and accuses Hagar of despising her as the real issue. Okay, So is that the real issue? And I will tell you that we've already looked at this. Sarah has been in the land for 10 years and God keeps appearing to Abraham and saying that I'm going to do this. I'm going to bring forth the seed and told Abraham, I will bring forth this seed out of your loins, but never said anything to Sarah. We still won't get that for another counting, counting the whole rest of this chapter, three more chapters. Um, so, Behind all of that is, is a feeling of inadequacy, a feeling of betrayal by God, maybe betrayal by Abraham, who knows, betrayal by Hagar. Uh, you know, this isn't right. This shouldn't have gone this way. This is, you know, I was trying to do the right thing. Anybody know any of these thoughts, you know? They're like buzzards. They just circle and, you know, oh, yeah. They're, they want to eat that dead flesh that's not Christ's dead flesh. <clears throat> and they can eat you alive, man. It just, it just grows and grows. So in verse 5, Sarah takes the blame for allowing them to join put in parentheses, my bad, and is using nice wording to tell Abraham to make a choice of which woman he will be with. Abraham called Hagar your maid instead of my wife and puts the situation back in Sarah's hands. Okay, so Abraham did that, but God will do that. See, I I don't even know where it is. Recently, the Lord had me write down a bunch of stuff on on justice and injustice. Um, but we think that that's really what God's all about. And there are, there are time after time, in verse after verse, chapter after chapter, book after book, where that's not what God's dealing with. Um, anybody ever read the book of Habakkuk? You know, he's going, you know, this ain't right. You, you've sent all of these, you know, this foreign land and this foreign king, and they're, they're 
driving us and mistreating us and doing all and all this bad stuff and everything. And this this, this isn't right. He's griping to God as a prophet. This isn't right. I'm telling you. And I mean, he's just like off the hook, man. He's just he is just upset. And so God speaks to him and says, well, Israel has done this and this and this. And while they did all these things in the flesh, you guys have violated me over and over and over. So I'm going to bring justice to you too. How about that? Uh, let me rethink what I was saying here. <laughs> you know, because the prophet knew that Israel had been off. And knew that they had been violating the Lord. And these guys are just, you know, heathen dogs. So, of course, they're doing what they're doing. And so God has to do a number on Habakkuk until in the end. What's some of the stuff he says in the last chapter? Do you remember off the cuff? That's that's what I was looking for right there. Well, if there is no harvest, you know, I will bless the Lord. That He totally changes. And he goes, this is not about justice or we'd all be dead. This is about God getting his son out of us in a certain spirit. Book of Job. Same thing. You know. Isaiah. Isaiah. Six, well, you know, I saw the Lord high and lifted. Well, before that, all the chapters leading up to that, he's going, Whoa, unto you people. You know, I'm a prophet, I'm God's prophet. Hey, you know, this is early in his ministry. You know, the first five verses, you know, he's got what, 64 or something like that, you know, 66. So here's, so he's going, woe unto you that drink wine and da, 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 when the wine is red in the gel, uh, glass and woe unto you that do this and woe unto you. And he's laying into everybody and going, I'm supposed to do this. I'm the prophet. And then I saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up. And, you know, and now I see the Lord. And then he says, woe is me. First time he goes like this and says, whoa, 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 you know. There's no need to, see, that's the same thing as judging. Injustice. I, I'm judging this injustice or whatever. You got, you got more stuff than you realize, like Habakkuk was talking about. You know, you think they're bad. This is God going, you think those people are bad? Look at this and this and this and this. Look how they've ignored my word to them, my heart to them. And so until we learn that lesson, we're going to judge and we're going to, you know, gripe about this and we're going to do that. But once we learn the lesson, we'll go, the lesson is... It's not about justice or injustice or, or what's wrong so that I can judge it or what's right so that I can judge it right. Wrong tree. It's about Christ. It's about the nature of Christ. It's about the Lamb of God being given on the altar of our heart to the Father over and over and over and over and over again. Early and the, the morning and the evening sacrifice every day for the rest of your life. Keeping that sweet savor rising up to the glory of the father and he's just going i love this person i love i love this 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 church new creation fellowship i love there's there's a bunch of them in there i really love this you know they give me the lamb in this form different form and then there's you know so and so but no no I'm kidding. He doesn't judge. He deals, but he doesn't have to judge. So, um, okay, I, don't, I didn't get very far here on this. Um, 
So everything centers on the baby of promise, which is Ishmael, and he's not the baby of promise. He is not going to be the firstborn of God's heart. And, that, and that's another way to look at it. Not just in this story. The firstborn of God's heart. Not the firstborn we perceive. Because that's what they're doing. That's what, that's what Abraham has done from the beginning. Well, it must be Lot then. Because da 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 da. No, then it must be Eliezer. No, no, then. Well, it must be Ishmael. No. <laughs> You're trying to find the firstborn instead of trying to find the firstborn of his heart. You're not looking there. You're looking at the circumstances and trying to match up his word with, oh, look, this fits. Well, it didn't fit at all. You know, remember what God said when he brought up Eliezer? This shall not be the seed. He was emphatic. This will not be it. And that's when that was at that point when he said, the seed I want will come out of your own loins. Okay, he didn't say, he didn't say it's just in my heart. He said, I want what's in my heart coming out of your flesh. Now, mostly I tend to share about Christ in you and the lamb coming out of you, right? But that's why we had this in Christ stuff. And God's bombarding it with a lot of it to make sure we understand that we have a standing in him based on him. But he wants a standing in us based on him. See, it doesn't happen automatically, but this is... You know, I mean, I, I wish somebody had told me this early on. Because at least I would have known, I could have been settled on being in Christ, which I was. I mean, I, I really saw that reality when I was a missionary in Jamaica. Early, just before, I guess, or maybe at the early going there, but it was right, right there. And when I got to Jamaica, man, oh man, it just, you know, I was just sailing because... I'm in him, and, you know, that's settled, and nothing's going to change, and, you know, because he would have to change, and, and I'm in him, and he's not going to turn into the devil. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I it really, I mean, I was, I got so settled in that, I mean, cemented into Christ, you know, not just in Christ, and then he moved, and I bobble around inside of him, plopping around in there. I mean, cemented in Christ. Okay, another one of my weird pictures, sorry. But they'll, they'll never stop. But that's not what we're dealing with tonight. Uh, but she deals overly harsh with Hagar. And then runs away, Hagar, runs away from what she may perceive as an untenable living situation. All right. Uh, Hagar is totally aware of what this family is about. You know what I'm saying? That Well, they're about the seed. This is what they're about. And Sarah should have been... Totally aware of that, too, because at this point, we will see this clearly from the scriptures. Both Abraham and Sarah believe that this is going to be the promised seed. But like Abraham, and I was, that's the point I was trying to make a while ago, like Abraham, he goes, okay, uh, she's griping to him, and he goes... Um, Okay, you make the decision. I mean, my first thought is, if I was her, I would go, oh, you're the head, and I don't even want to go there. I just want to be under you and the Lord as we go forward. And you can say, well, why would he say that? Because let me tell you, one, I probably got it in my notes here, but one of the worst things you can do is give somebody who thinks they know it all 
the power to do stuff. Because <laughs> they will do it with the power, you know, of, of their own nature and everything. They'll make this, and you know, and it's all justifiable. Well, I'm doing this because it's it's for the common good. This has what your common good has absolutely nothing with maintaining the seed. Okay, now you say, where do you get that from, Brother Randy? Well, you get it from this story right here because when she deals harshly with her, she leaves. Now it has absolutely nothing to do with the, con- the, with the seed, at least the perceived seed, right? I mean, she's, she's done a thing that she says it's for the common good. Well, it's for her good so that, you know, she's not having to deal with that stuff. But it, it's not thinking about the seed, uh, I'm sure Abraham's going, uh, look, you haven't, you know, but he can't say that. You haven't anted up in 10 years. You know, again, sorry about my Texas hold'em. Uh, you haven't anted up in 10 years, you know. Uh, so we shouldn't be driving her off because she's got the, the seed. Well, that's at least trying to think in terms of the seed instead of the common good. Let me tell you, the common good doesn't always, it's not always commonly good. <laughs> no. See, a leader knows that because it's not. You have to make a lot of decisions that people don't like. And they go, well, this, ain't, this couldn't be it. This isn't good. You go, well... That's what I heard from the Lord. Well, then you're not hearing from the Lord. <laughs> you go, well, I think I am. Um, and then if you get enough that rise up against that and say, oh, I don't, 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 then you do the right thing. You release the seed. You go into death. Let them have their way. It's your decision. You do it then. You let them have their way, but you go into a death so that they don't die, <laughs> so that Christ will come forth in them. And But that's the only way to proceed. If the firstborn is the issue, then I, if, if I'm not going to get it here, then you have, to, you have to be the one. You know? You can't. And you can't use any of this stuff, because I remember when I... Um, and I'm sorry I use examples from my life all the time, but it's the only life I lived. <laughs> so, but bless you. We can cast that out later, but yeah, okay. I think you just sneezed the thought I was going to talk about right out of it. No, no, no. It's, it's all your fault. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> she was expecting me to go, no, 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 it's okay. <laughs> That's a joke. Okay, you're not going to hell. Yet. <laughs> um, of course, the real issue is not Hagar, her baby, or the living situation. The real issue is Sarah's inability to bring forth the seed that God wanted out of her. Can you believe that? If you're, if you're somewhat in tune with this, but see, that, even that stuff gets twisted. But you're somewhat, you're Sarah, you're somewhat in tune with this, and you're going, um, you know, okay, I need to quit ki- kicking the cat. The real issue is that I'm, I haven't brought forth the seed. Okay, but we turn these situations in our mind. See, there wouldn't be all this turning and flipping and doing all that and buzzard circulating and stuff like that if we get the mind of Christ. We let this mind be in you, which also in Christ Jesus, and it goes on to talk about he was given even unto death. He was obedient even unto death. That's the end goal. That's to know him. Being made conformable to his death. You know, fellowship and with him in his sufferings. Well, we think fellowship with him in his sufferings is when we feel hurt because Sarah, you know, rose above us and insulted us. Oh, my God. 
I'm fellowshipping in your sufferings and I'm with you, Lord, in the cross. And he's going. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, that's not good to call something that is just your flesh whining the cross. Come on with it. Should I preach more? Yes. Harder? <laughs> Father, we thank you for we thank you for your son. We thank you that you have not just called him your son, but you fathered him in us. And you father him as son in us. And we many times just think it's about us and not really, really meet with your heart on that. Why you put that son in us. Father, we thank you that that as branches we can grow out from him but our growth is going to be based on the amount of his life that begins to fill our little branch and the more of that that comes in the larger we get enlarged we get and therefore the ability to bear much fruit May you have an increase of your son. He must increase. It's not just a verse to us. May we have an increase of your son and a decrease of us. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right.